Now, last week, I, I shared two verses just in passing uh, from the book of Acts, verse 20, where Paul says to the Ephesian elders, he's telling them that it's probably the last time they're going to see him. They're very, you know, very emotional and everything. But he, he, in his farewell speech to them, he said this in verse 20. He says, I never shrank back from telling you what you need to hear. And then in verse, seven verses later, in verse 27, he says, For I, never, for I didn't shrink back to, from declaring all that God wants you to know. Now, that stuck in my spirit in the week, and I felt God wanted me to drill down a little bit deeper into that. What does God want you to know? What does he want us to know? I believe there's a long list of things that God wants us to know. I want to share with you just this morning seven things, because I want to know what God wants me to know. Do you know what God wants you to know? Allow me to share just seven, okay. Number one, God wants you to know that he loves you. Uh, duh. No, God wants you to know he loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love. Doesn't matter where you've been. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter what was done to you or done by you or through you. God loves you. In fact, the Bible says that while we were lost in our sin, God demonstrated his love in, that, in sending Jesus to die for us. While you were parting away your life, God still loved you. When you were doing that thing that you so regret, you want nobody else to know, God loved you. While you lived those years just ignoring God, God loved you. While you were living that lifestyle where you just blasphemed God, God never stopped loving you. There's nothing you can do today that will cause him to love you less or more tomorrow. He loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love. And if that's your only takeaway from today, never forget it. God loves you. Secondly, God wants you to know that you were created with a purpose. You're not a mistake. You're not a slip-up. You were created in the image and the likeness of God, the God of creation. You were created to be an image bearer, to shine the light of God on this planet. You can make a difference in people's lives. I thank God for the people in my life at different stages of my Christian walk, this race of faith that came into my life, sometimes just for a very brief season. And yet they encouraged me. They kept me on the, on the path. They strengthened me, supported me. I thank God for those people. One elder by a crazy name of Bunny, he was called Bunny Eaton. Old man in the first church where I got saved. A couple of months after I got saved, I wanted to go back to Egypt. So on a Friday night, I thought, okay, well, tonight's Friday night. It's a drinking night. The boys will still be down at the pub. Haven't been there for some months. Go and play snooker and drink with them. Getting ready to go out, knock on the door. In comes Bunny Eaton. Hey, Zane, how are you doing, man? Just passing by. I thought I'll just pop in. Let me pray for you. Wow. You can't go drinking after that because the guy prayed a powerful prayer. Thank God for him. We are the bunny Eatons in this church. That'll just pop in. Just give a phone call and say, hey, let me pray for you. Thank God for the old aunties in the church. Auntie Edna. 
some months later, I decided to go back to Egypt again. Because church was just becoming very boring to me. Initially, it was so vibrant. So Every time I went, God would speak to me. The worship was so powerful. God's presence was in the room. And then several months down the line, it just, eh, just another service. So on the Sunday morning, and some of you have heard the story many times before, Sunday morning, I said, God, I'm going to church today. But if you don't talk to me, I'm not coming back. I went to church, went to the service. Nothing. As dead as a d- dodo. Nothing. Nothing in the worship. Nothing in the preaching. I walked out and I said, that's it. I'm not coming back. That afternoon, I felt a little bit convicted. So I said, God, I'll give you one more chance. <laughs> of course, because I'm a good guy. Half, half good guy. I'll give you one more chance. I'll go to service tonight, but if you don't talk to me, I'm not coming back. I'm giving this up as some, I was deceived. Went to the service, nothing. Absolutely not, deader than the morning service. I think I was the first one to jump up and leave. As I got to my car, I heard this old auntie shout, Zane, Zane. Turned around, it's Auntie Edna. Came up and said, how are you doing? So I lied to her and I said, no, I'm doing fine. But I could see, when she looked at me, you could see it's like she's looking right into my soul. She said, I want you to know, God woke me up in the early hours of this morning. I said, pray for Zane. Where would I be? If it wasn't for the Uncle Bunnies, Bunny Eatons and the Auntie Edna's. I know there are Auntie Edna's in this church. Thank God for them. But may God raise up many, many more. God has created you for a purpose. God wants to use you to change lives. You know, it says of David, now after David had served God, served God's purpose in his own generation, he died. God wants to use you. God wants you to serve your generation. Make a difference in their lives. Number three, God wants you to know that a life of sin separates us from him. Very simple, very plain. Go to Isaiah chapter 59. The heading of that, that chapter is actually says a warning against sin. And there we read, listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you. Nor is his ear too deaf to hear your call. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. It's because of your sins that he has turned away and will not listen any more. Very clear, very simple. These are the instructions from God. I am holy, therefore you must be holy. Sin separates us from God. Nowhere in the Bible, nowhere will you find that God says it's okay for you to just manage your sins and we can still be buddies. Nowhere. Sin separates us. Where sin is present, God is absent. Where sin is absent, God is present. God wants you to know that. Number four, God wants us to know, God wants us to know that we must look ahead. We must look ahead. Let go of your past, your past mistakes, past failures, past mess-ups. We've all got them. We've all got them. But stop looking back. And thinking that because of them, you're disqualified from the power and the purposes of God today and tomorrow. We need to be like Paul in Philippians chapter 3. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind, I strain towards what is ahead. I press on. I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ has taken hold of me. And I tell you what, Paul had a lot in his past. 
that he could have spent a lot of time moping about. I mean, he went about destroying people's lives, Christians. He went about imprisoning Christians. He went about destroying the church of Jesus Christ, putting women and children into jail. And yet he says, forgetting that what is behind me, I'm moving forward. I'm going forward. Max Licardo says that there ain't no future in the past. You can't change yesterday, but you can do something about tomorrow. Put God's plan in place. Stop looking and staring at yesterday. God has got awesome, awesome plans for your tomorrow. Number five, God wants to know, yes, you are your brother's keeper. It's the first, first question that Adam's children asked God. That's recorded in the Bible. Cain asked God, when God asked him, where's Abel? Am I my brother's keeper? We should be invested in other people's lives enough to know when things are out of whack. When things are not going right. When we can step in and help and maybe support, if necessary, where possible. There's a very sobering proverb from Proverbs chapter 21. Whoever shuts their ears to the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be answered. Number six, God wants you to know his house is a priority with him. Very important, I believe. God's church is filled with lives that have been changed through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are all trophies of God's grace. Once we were lost, now we are found. Once I was blind, spiritually blind, now I can see. Once I was a leper, a reject of society. With no hope. And along came Jesus. Washed me. Cleansed me. Healed me. Loved me. Once I didn't have a family. Didn't have a home. But he made me one of his children. And he brought me into his house. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. God places a great emphasis and great importance on his house and he expects you and me to do so as well. And if you're not sure about that, I encourage you to go and read the book of Haggai. We've been through it many times in the past few decades. But in the book of Haggai, we find out just how important God's house is to him. And yes, I know in the Old Testament, we're talking about bricks and mortar when you talk about God's house, because that's where he presents himself. Today in the New Testament, you and I are those bricks. We are built into a house, but God still wants to inhabit us, inhabit the praises of his people. So when we come together, God shows up. God wants to. God wants us to enjoy his presence. But God said to his children back then, because their lives were, <laughs> their lives were, were falling apart, and they probably were blaming the devil like most of us do when things go wrong. Huh? It's the devil. This time it was God that was pulling out the mat from under their feet. In other words, the quality of, of our lives can be impacted or affected by how we treat God's house. Is it a priority in your life or not? Yeah, in, 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 in Haggai, he says to them, he says, you've planted much, but you harvested little. 
You earn wages to put them into a purse with holes in. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be a little. What you brought home, I blew away. <laughs> Why? declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each one of you is busy with your own house. God's not, a, God's not against us owning a home or owning a house, building homes and houses. God's not against that. But what the problem was here was priority. They started fixing up the house of God, but then they just spent all their time, their energy, their treasure, and their effort in their own homes. And houses, and God was calling them out for that. Selwyn Hughes said that the local church is God's address, God's earthly address, and I agree with him. Local church is God's earthly address. I believe there's nothing like the local church when the local church is working right. I believe it's God's vehicle of blessing into every community. I believe it's a place where people who love and follow Jesus can come and can worship passionately, serve sacrificially, give generously, and invite people to come and be part of God's family. God wants us to know that his house is precious to him and should be precious to us. As well. Number seven, I believe God wants us to know yes, there is life after this life. Question asked by Job thousands of years ago if a man dies, will he live again? Question I asked in my, in my youth. I believe it's a question that weighs on the hearts and minds of every human being. What happens beyond the grave? We need to understand that how we live our lives on it, how we live in, in this life is going to affect, make a massive difference in your next life. That's why I like the Bible acronym. Basic information before leaving earth. Basic information before leaving earth. A lot of information in the Bible we need to know. And you need to know it before you leave this planet. What legacy are you going to leave behind? There's a guy in the Bible called Jehoram. Don't know much about him. You can find his story in 2 Chronicles 21. It says Jehoram, I, I read this the other day, Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem for eight years. In other words, he died at the age of 40. 40 years. Then it's the next sentence that blew me away. The next sentence says, He passed away to no one's regret. Imagine that living your life for 40 years. And basically people say, well, good riddance. I heard this long ago. They said, somebody said, you must live your life. Well, they said, you know, when you, when you were born, you cried. And a lot of people rejoiced. And they said, live your life in such a way that when you die, many people will cry and you will rejoice. I thought that's good. Apparently, when I was born, I was such an ugly baby that the doctor actually slept my mother. Was, that's what my older brothers and sisters used to tell me. When you get to the end of your life, you're either going to be able to say what Saul said or what Paul said. Very, very different. Poles apart. King Saul at the end of his life said this, I've played, he said, I have sinned. 
I've played the fool. I've erred exceedingly. Apostle Paul, at the end of his life, could say, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. What a difference. These are seven things that I believe God wants you and me to know. Amen. Tot zover.